entitled The Forgotten Foe. And if it's not obvious enough, what is that foe? Anybody? Sin. That's right. The forgotten foe uh, that we will be talking about through the topic of sin. You know that some people like to avoid this topic because it's got a negative connotation. Some people try to uh, tolerate it or minimize it. We as a church have decided to not do any of those things but to face this together, right? Because sin is real. Sin is powerful. Sin is the most dangerous source of destruction in the universe. Sin is more powerful than Satan himself. Sin being independence from or rebelling toward the creator of the universe, God, by way of any thought or any emotion or any action or attitude or posture. Uh, sin is to say, I am my own authority. I am my own God. Uh, which is why sin is behind every problem we experience, everything we see and face that, that is heading toward decay or destruction in life, within this world, in our feelings, in our relationships. We might have walked in this service today and there may have been moments or people or situations that have felt discomforting, have felt as if they were wrong or uh, that they brought bother or they brought tension in our hearts and our emotions. All of that is because of sin. Sin behind everything. And we're not just talking about the sin that we commit or the sins that have been committed, maybe against us. We are talking about the deadly, infectious disease of sin that flows through both our physical veins because our bodies also experience the effects of sin, but also our spiritual veins. So last week, we looked at sin's origin. Where and how did sin originate for human beings on this earth? Anyone remember where, where that happened? Can you want to shout it out? Garden. The garden. All right. And we looked at the account of how sin entered the world. We're going to continue to look at that same account, but we're going to see it from the vantage point of how sin spread. And it became universal. Sin's universality. And how all of the human race has been affected as such. So let's continue to fight this foe together, this enemy because we must fight it. Church, you know that although Satan tempts us and wants to deceive us towards sin, you know what also he wants for us not to confront sin, for us to minimize, for us to be the types of people that forget that it's a foe so we can tolerate it, so we can reduce it's impact there. It's power. But we're not going to do that as a church. Today, um, the sermon will also be a little more of a teaching style. We're going to go uh, through this topic of sin um, every week so that we really know it and not ignore or forget it. So join me now as we read uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. Again, we are still looking at the garden, yet from a different perspective, if you will, as we tackle the foe. Of the human race, and it says in verse 12, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way, death spread to all people because all sinned. In fact, sin was in the world before the law, but sin is not charged to a person's account when there is no law. In other words, it's talking about how people view sin as committing. A breaking of the law. Nevertheless, verse 14 says, Death reigned from Adam to Moses, which is before God gave the law to Moses. Even over those who did not sin in the likeness of Adam's transgression. Meaning who did not specifically know they were breaking a law of God. He is a type of the coming one. Okay, we're going to stop there and we're going to kind of camp there a little bit. 
and look at this passage from different angles. Throughout our history and lives, I mean, maybe many of us can come up with a few names of very significant individuals that lived throughout history that you can say, I can say, have changed the course of human history, like really radically impacted the course of the direction of human history. Anybody can come up with some names? I'm going to ask you to shout some out, but I'm going to give you an idea. Thomas Edison. Everyone know who Thomas Edison is? How was he impactful? Anybody remember? He invented the, the light bulb. So now we are in here and we're going to have to turn on fire to see. He also invented how to distribute electricity to large areas. Can you imagine, you know, how much that changed the way that we live? He also invented the, 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 the motion camera. Right? And a few other inventions. He had over a thousand patents of inventions, some of which really revolutionized the way we live our lives. Who else is significant that you can think of? Anybody? Anybody? I, I thought of another one. Anyone know who Alexander Fleming is? Anybody to see if anyone knows who that is? <laughs> Alexander Fleming discovered or invented? The world's first antibiotic, penicillin, right, 1928. But you know why that was so significant? Because that reduced mortality by uncounted numbers. I mean, due to penicillin, babies that would have sneezed, you know, we get the phrase, God bless you, is because if somebody would have sneezed or coughed, they truly depended on God to bless them so that they would not die from a fever. You know, penicillin saved like 80% of the death, death rate. As well, if someone would get a cut, you know, there were huge chances that that cut would be infected and that would lead to amputation. But because of penicillin and then what came after that, we're here sitting comfortably uh, because of that medicine. Anybody else that you can think of? I would think of Abraham Lincoln, Graham, Alexander Graham Bell, yes. What about William Tyndale? Anybody know who that is? I hope you maybe do. <laughs> William Tyndale translated the Bible first person to English. Right? Again, we would not be here. He, he truly changed the course of Christianity across the world. And you know what? He was hung and burned for translating the Bible. Did you know that? Wow. Alexander the Great. Like he moved Greco culture across like a, a lot of the East. In pop culture, we've got the Beatles, changed music, you know, um, Michael Jordan, changed basketball, right? He is like the face that, that, that caused basketball to explode across the world. In the Bible, we've got Elijah, Moses, we've got Esther, right? Esther, through her one act of boldness, saved the Jewish race. And of course, negatively, we can even today talk about people like Fidel Castro, who, because of that one individual, I mean, think about the significance that today we have the Miami we have today. All the Cubans that migrated here and essentially built the city. So we can think of many, many significant individuals, but please listen. All those names we mentioned, as influential that they are, they pale in comparison to two men that we've briefly touched on today through our passage. In fact, according to God's perspective, essentially there only are two men that live in this world. One of those men is Adam and the other is who? Jesus Christ. That's who God sees. He sees two people living on this earth. Either those that are in Adam or those that are in Christ. Two representative men before God for humanity. And we're reading that through one man, Adam, the foe of sin entered the world and changed all of human history. And with this sin came death, which resulted in the fall. So our driving question for today is, why are we universally sinners by nature. 
I know that we think of the way that we commit sin or the sin that we see. But the question we're asking is, why are we by nature sinners? And we just read, it's I think clear, point number one, because Adam sinned. That's why we are universally sinners by nature. We've read that just as sin entered the world through one man and then death, in this way it spread to all people. That's why we are sinners, because Adam sinned. Now, of course, this always leads to a debated follow-up questions that many pose. For example, people, some people will ask, well, why, why Adam? Why through Adam? Wasn't Eve there too? Why did sin enter through the one man, Adam? What happened to Eve? Well, Adam was God's chosen representative for mankind. It wasn't Eve. Eve was created with the role and responsibility to be Adam's helper. The very name Adam means mankind. That is why when God came to Adam and Eve, he looked to Adam, and I paraphrase saying, I get what Eve did. I know I'm trying to blame her, but I get what she did. But where were you? You were the one that I've selected to be the representative. You know that if Eve would have eaten the fruit and not Adam, we would not have had the fall. Because it was through Adam. Here's another big question. I'm sure many of you think of this. Why is all humanity guilty for Adam's sin if we weren't there with Adam? Why are we asking the question that I am by nature a sinner if it happened through Adam, not me? And we'll answer that question under our second point for today in a minute. But for now, let's talk about this foe a little bit more that we inherited from Adam's sin. So important because all religions in this world, except for true biblical Christianity, they base their view of sin, we base our view of sin as an action, something bad we did or we do or need to avoid. But today we view through our passage that without having to commit a sin, by nature, we are sinners. We are infected by a universal disease that infects every human being called sin. So am I saying that if I commit a sin, it's actually Adam's fault and not mine? No, that's not at all what I'm saying. My commission or my committing of sin is sin before God and guilty of, of punishment. We'll definitely talk about the acts of sin we commit within our series and why we ought to repent of them. But for today, the focus is about the deeper core as to why a person even sins to begin with. Namely, that we commit acts of sin because universally by nature, we are sinners. And this is an important distinction to make so that we properly understand what Christianity is, brothers and sisters. It's easy to forget this regarding our foe. How? By reducing our foe or the power of sin to something we simply do or don't do. And then what happens? We do view this enemy of sin like the mistakes that we've made. We view it and say things like, man, I messed up. Well, we all make mistakes. Well, no one is perfect. We say things like that because we're viewing the sin as if it's simply something we've committed or something we need to avoid. Or we view it like destructive patterns or problems that we need to avoid. Or we tell our kids. What do we tell our kids? Make sure you're good. Make sure before you go to school that you're good. You listen to your teacher. You do all your work that you're good. Make sure you're good. And we ought to tell our kids that, shouldn't we? But we also need to understand that both the good kids at school and the bad ones are equally condemned sinners before God. As all children are universally sinners by nature. We were born with a sinful nature because Adam sinned in the garden. And at some point that must be accepted as a universal reality lest a person becomes their own standard of righteousness or of good and bad. If we don't get that, we will base everything off of be good, don't be bad. And then we will be bad, and we will keep it there. So again, although we do commit acts of sin against 
God's law and are held responsible for the sins we willfully commit. More than that, today we are seeing that we are sinners under a curse of sin and death that Adam committed in the garden. Now, why is it important to understand this distinction or this essence of sin? Because to understand true Christianity, we must know a few things, right? We, we must know that Jesus did come and he did live the life that we could not live. He did die on a cross to redeem and to forgive and to, to save me from the sins that I have committed. Jesus came and I get to repent of my sins and be set free of all that I've done. Praise God for that. Hallelujah. Jesus, we know, also has come to redeem us from the sins that were committed against us. And now we carry the sinful emotions of all the things that were done against us. And praise God, we get to come to Jesus and we get to give him Everything that was done against us, and that is now released from the bondage of our own emotional sinfulness. But please, let's, let's be very clear. The primary reason why Jesus has come, because those two reasons don't encapsulate why Jesus has come and died for my sins. He has come to set me free from the penalty that comes from being, by nature, a sinner rooted in Adam's sin, committed and producing the fall for all humanity. Therefore, the true freedom that God desires for all of us is available through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ who has come not just to save me from my sins that I've committed, but to reverse the curse of sin that compels me to even sin to begin with. It's a disease that I've been set free from. One of the things that we experience in our home is that we could be quietly sitting, having dinner, at peace, and all of a sudden, our dog Gideon, like, he just barks like a crazy dog because he sees somebody walk through the front of our house, right? And it, and it literally upsets me. It's like, it literally does. It's like, come on, Gideon. Stop being such a dog. <laughs> but he's a dog. He's a dog who barks. And he will not stop being a dog as much as he tries to be a human being, which he does. He's a dog. It's the same way we should not view this world and see all the problems that we face and immediately try to socialize the problem. Immediately try to see how something can fix the issue when, listen, human beings are sinners. That's not going to change. Sometimes people ask the question, but is that person born with that sinful inclination? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. And we see it in our text. As sin entered the world through one man, death through sin. This way, death spread to all people. It was before the law. Meaning that, let's be clear, you don't have to break the law as justification of sin. That we could read right now sitting in this place and overcome with the emotions and effects of sin because by nature it's who we are, it's our flesh. It's part of the human race, even over those, as it says in our text, who did not sin in the likeness of Adam's transgression. If we're not clear with this, we can read a, more passages of Scripture. I just want to mention a few. Ephesians 2.3 tells us, We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. It's like if people were to be comparing themselves, okay, those people, those are, those are bad sinners. They're carrying out the desires of their nature, as we too are guilty of. 
Romans 3, also 10 through 12 says, What then? Are we better off? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews, who are very religious, and Greeks, who are pagans, are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous. Not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good. Not even one. And that is a reference from both Psalm 14, 1 through 3, which I have on the screen as well, as 53 verses 1 through 3 as well, says that the fool says in his heart, there is no God, they are corrupt, they do vile deeds, there is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the human race to see if there is one who is wise, one who seeks God. But no, I don't see anybody because all have turned away. All alike have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. You see why we are universal sinners? Is that clear yet? Because Adam sinned and then sin entered the world. And I am by nature inheriting Adam's sin. But here's the second answer to that question, point number two. Not just because Adam sinned, but because we have sinned in Adam. Because we sinned in Adam. Look at our text again, verse 12, and we're going to emphasize on this other angle. It says, as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death spreads to all people. And look what it says, because all sinned. Hold on a second. What does this mean? I thought I just read it's through Adam's sin. Why does it then say because all sinned? And from here is where we get the classic questions that arise that I said we would talk about. For example, how can God blame me for sinning when I wasn't there with Adam? Right? How can God hold me responsible acting out of a sinful nature I was already born with? It's Adam's fault, God, not mine. It's not fair, God. It sounds like one of our new boys, Devante. Right? He always says it's not fair. Not fair. Not fair. It's not fair this person gets to do this. And it's not fair that he gets to sit in the front. It's not fair. And that's what gets, gets him in the most trouble with Marilyn. Because she doesn't like to hear him say things are not fair. But the reality is that theologians and scholars have studied and argued over this matter throughout centuries. As they should, because we are talking about the fall of the entire human race through Adam. Now, then what is going on? What do you mean sin entered through one man, but also you're saying because all sinned? It's one or the other. How does that correlate? How does that connect? Well, some people argue that God knew the souls of all the human race before they were even conceived in their mother's womb. And all the soul, souls were somehow there present with Adam, being that Adam represented all the human race. And that's a stretch, but it's one of the theories. Another theory is what is called the Edwards Identity Theory. And, and that is that in the garden, the entire human race was present, not because our souls were there, but, but because we were all there in the mind of God. And because... What is present in the mind of God is present in reality beyond all time. We all sinned. And okay, that can make a little more sense, but this is what the Bible clearly teaches. That Adam was the federal head representative of the human race. Again, Adam means mankind. And what Adam did in the garden was not just for himself, but for all those he represented. God is the one who appointed him as such to act on behalf of himself and behalf of all of the human race. Again, Adam and not Eve. It's kind of like the movie The Hunger Games, if you've watched it, where the main character, Candace Evergreen, served as both substitute and representative, federal head for her district. If she wins the Hunger Games, the whole district is impacted positively. If she loses, they, are, they, they would all die. <laughs> but many will respond, but okay, so if Adam is my federal head representative, I didn't choose him to represent me, right? I, he, 
he, he was chosen by God, not by me, as if we're choosing a politician, right? That's also the person that is so individualistic in their thinking. But the way God has done it is that if the offensive line, one of them is offsides, the whole team is penalized. But still, a teammate could look at that offensive lineman and say, it was your fault, not mine. So in the case of Adam, this is what's happening. God selected him as representative, and because it was God, he made that selection infallibly, impeccably, perfectly righteous and just. In other words, nowhere in time and space have we been more perfectly and personally represented than we were at the Garden of Eden by the representation that God selected to act in our behalf as if we ourselves were there committing the sin as well. So the person that would say, okay, no way, man, that's not fair, God, that person would have to challenge God and his perfect justice. That person would be thinking too highly of him or herself because that person would have done the same thing or worse. And if that person holds tightly to that position of God, it's not fair, then you're going to have to challenge God also when Jesus Christ stands as your representative before his throne of judgment. So why are we universally by sinners, or sinners by nature? Because Adam sinned and because we have sinned in Adam. Now, church, quick question. Why do you think we've chosen to preach over this series, sin? Why really, like, dig into it and talk about this? Why, why do you think? Because... This matter is important, it's significant, it's real to God. Like, some people, we know, many, freak out over the power and the effects of COVID. But to God, it's more deadly to respond to COVID sinfully than COVID is itself. To God, that is much more fatal to respond to COVID sinfully, in rebellion toward God. So it's not just a foe. This is also, as we said, the fall of the human race. Because sin leads to, leads to death. Sin and death are the head and tails of the same coin. Like, why is anyone even suffering due to COVID? Why does anyone die? Because of the effects of sin in the human body, in the soul, in the mind, the world. If we look at our text again, you see the emphasis, it tells us, and death through sin. Verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned. If we look in other parts of Scripture, we know that God told Adam and Eve in the garden, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2, verse 17, for on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Romans 6, 16 tells us, don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves at that, of the, that one you obey either of sin leading to death or of Adam? Or of obedience leading to righteousness. Romans 6.23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Chapter 8 verse 2 tells us, Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Chapter 8 verse 6 says, Now the mindset of the flesh is death. But the mindset of the spirit of life is life and peace. And verse 13 tells us that because if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. Like, this is such important news here. It's like when the, 
leader of the CDC comes up and tells us all the precautions and all the reasons why COVID would lead somebody to die and people are freaking out. This is more scary. This is more impactful. Eternal. We can't forget this foe. We can't minimize it. And the world may want to choose to laugh about it and celebrate it and parade about it and tolerate it. And maybe we may moralize sin a bit in, according to our own standard or look to the government to socialize our sin. But sin before the judgment seat of God is punishable by eternal death. So we as a church must never reduce disregard, minimize, sin for any reason. The stakes are too high. The price to pay is too severe. Which is why church, please listen. Which is why the death, the death of Christ upon the cross is so amazing. It's worth us celebrating from the top of the rooftops, from the top of a mountain. It's like when Jason said, We've just sang a song that is worthy for us to say, Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus has reversed the curse of death. It's why we've gathered at church today. It's like the person, the shepherd that lost the, that lost the sheep, or the woman that lost the coin, and when they found the sheep or the coin, they threw a party. It's like a person that unfortunately may be facing cancer treatments because they've been pronounced terminal. And God produces a miracle and saves them. It would move us to tears and joy and the family would rejoice that they were saved for a few more temporary years from cancer. This is that much more profound that Jesus has come to save us from the fall of the human race. But most importantly, that's why our text, as we look at it one more time, we can see to close that there is this one word that I've ignored, but I'm going to talk about it now. It's the, I think, most important word because our entire passage hinges by that word, and it's the word therefore. Right? The word therefore. The word therefore moves us to talk about the foe of the human race or the fall of the human race into the favor for the human race, right? The favor for the human race. Now, we see therefore because it's there for a reason. And it hinges us to something written prior to this text regarding sin and death. And so let's just read through it. I'm not going to explain it because that's not our text uh, that we're focusing on. I just want to read through it and we will get the answer to why therefore is therefore. Romans 5, starting in verse 6, it says, For while we were still helpless at the right, right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? For if while we were enemies, because of the foe that is our enemy, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son then how much more, having been reconciled, will, be, will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received his reconciliation. Moving on to our focus passage, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death spread to all people because all sinned, in fact, sin was in the world before the law, but sin is not charged to a person's account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death did reign from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin in the likeness of Adam's transgression, because he was a type of the one coming. Okay, so that's 
That's the bad news. But as we continue to read, verse 15, but, that's another hinge word, therefore, but, but the gift is not like the trespass. For if by one man's trespass the many died, how much more have the grace of God and the gift which comes through the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflowed to the many. And the gift is not like the one man's sin because from one sin came the judgment resulting in condemnation. But from many trespasses came the gift resulting in justification. If by one man's trespass death reigned through that one man much, how much more will those who receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness reign, not in death, but in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? So I would like to ask this question. What is the application then in all of this? What, is, what do I do then, Lord? It's what verse 17 just told us. Receive his grace. I want to know how many of us have received the grace of God in Christ. It's the very reason why today we partake and celebrate of the Lord's communion. Right? This is a natural symbol that represents an eternal and supernatural reality that while yet we were still helpless sinners, Christ died for us and reconciled us. Not from the sins that we've committed alone, not from the sins that we experience in this world, but he reversed the curse of sin that by nature I carry in the flesh. So with that, what I'm going to ask is, I'm going to ask our guys that are going to pass the elements to, you guys can start coming up to the front. Because I'm one that likes to make sure that when I read something that says, those who received the overflow or the abundance of grace and the gift of one righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ, I want to be at church today and receive that. I want to be one that just doesn't think of like something I need to do, something I've once done, but something that I am invited to do today to receive the overflow of grace that is found in the living and active person and work of Jesus Christ interceding for us before the Father who if not through his death, we would be condemned to death. So if we get this church, we get Christianity. Because it revolves around the very important doctrine of what we call imputation. The theological term, imputation meaning to credit something to, the credit to the account of. And we know that there are two great imputations in the Bible. It's the great exchange. And to understand these two really gives us a solid grasp as to the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. That our sins and everything that comes with it was imputed upon Christ as he hung on the cross. And his righteousness was imputed. It was given to me by faith. That's the grace that we receive, right? And so what I'm going to ask, if that's you, don't, don't partake of this holy sacrament you know, casually. Right? Let's not treat it as an earthly, you know, insignificant, traditional matter. But treat it for the good news that it represents. Some of us here can sit where we're at in our seats and unload, confess the effects of our sinful nature before a God who has loved us with an everlasting love by sending Christ to die in our place. And so I'm going to ask that 
at your seats, you do just that. Right? You take the next few seconds and think about not just the sins you've committed, but the way you've responded sinfully to matters. Think about the ways that you've been wounded by others producing sinful emotions. Think about the way that your body is decaying, it hurts. Think about the sadness and the grief that you've experienced. Think about everything that, that comes from the nature of sin. And once again, relationally, personally, partake in that great exchange between yourself and Christ. Where you say, Jesus, here, here, this, this belongs to you. Lord, I now receive the abundance, the overflow of your grace. I'm set free. And let that be the position, the assurance that you receive. And, and from that, you recognize that once you come up to this table, it's a table for sinners. It's a table for the people that recognize, admit, acknowledge, repent of the very sin that we carry by nature. And can take the bread, you take the wine, you go back to your seats, and together as a united church, the saints of, of God, we get to be called the saints of God, we can partake of these elements together in worship. So take the next few seconds, spend some time with the Lord, and when you're ready, you can come up and receive the elements yourselves.